Hello, Dr. Reed. Thank you for joining Age Better. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about Apple's AirPods today. That's going to be the scope of our conversation. So Apple's new software update is being called a game changer. At least that's what I read in the article that you were heavily quoted in in the Wall Street Journal, which is how I got to you. It's a game changer for hearing health because Apple's technology specifically targets mild to moderate hearing loss people who are really not treated as much as those who have a lot of hearing loss. So they go untreated. Explain to us first, why is it so important that if you have mild or moderate hearing loss that you want to have this address? Like what, what happens if you don't? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, I think one thing you'll see often in the media is there's, there's a lot of research from a team that I've worked with for a long time at Johns Hopkins and our team at NYU uh, showing that hearing loss as we age is sort of associated with, you know, some negative aging outcomes. And what that means is, you know, it, it increases the risk slightly, right? Um, there's things like dementia, cognitive decline, physical, uh, physical decline, even social isolation. But, you know, when we see it framed that way, I think it's, it's not disingenuous. I think it's just that like, you know, people have never been good at taking these big data population statistics and turning them into the their selves, right? So, yes, you know, is smoking associated with cancer? Absolutely. Does it increase risk? Absolutely. But does every single person who smokes? No. So, so you see that a lot. I think of it more as, you know, hear well, think well, live well, right? And it's not so much this like risk of these terrible things happening and more just improving your life by making it easier to listen in difficult conversations, making it easier to engage with your loved ones and your friends, um, just overall sort of a pleasant rise all tides lift in life. Well, that's actually very encouraging because you're right. When you look at these statistics, it's like you make it, it makes it seem as though, OK, if my hearing loss is mild, I am going to get dementia. So thank you for putting some perspective on this. So one of the biggest barriers uh, we think and, and also based on that article that I read it, it is is with hearing aids and hearing loss and getting your hearing tested is stigma. There's a stigma because it means, oh, I must be getting old. In fact, I recently read an article in The Atlantic just a few days ago called The Secret to Getting Men to Wear Hearing Aids. And one man is quoted as saying, I hid my hearing loss. Hearing loss is something you associate with geezers. And that's true. I mean, we encounter a lot of that with health issues like bone loss associated with aging. Nobody wants to think about osteoporosis and the like. Then this is, I think, in that category. So it has like a bit of a PR issue. So recent estimates show that about 15% of Americans or about 53 million people have difficulty hearing. And that number, of course, will continue to grow. And yet, according to AARP, I thought this was interesting, adults over 40 are more likely to get colonoscopies than hearing tests. Such a simple thing to do. So how do you think the mainstream appeal of AirPods, I mean, so many of us use AirPods on a daily basis, combined with Apple's trusted brand, of course, might help reduce the stigma that is surrounding hair, uh, hear, hearing loss and, and wearing a hearing aid of some kind? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's so fascinating, right? Um, you know, we talk about stigma a lot, but I've always sort of had this belief that stigma is so hard to talk about with hearing loss and with hearing aids. And that's mainly because hearing care has not always been extremely accessible, right? It mostly exists outside of our healthcare system. Not Medicare does not cover any hearing aids or anything to do with hearing aids. You can basically get one hearing test a year ordered by your doctor. Um, and that's got to be for sort of a medical purpose, not necessarily hearing aids. And then private insurance maybe covers a little bit. Some of the uh, Medicare Advantage plans will cover something. But still, it's pretty expensive and difficult to access. And so when we talk about stigma, I always put like a little just in the back of your mind reminder that when something is $4,700 on average to address, and that's pretty much, you know, hearing aids really are... I'm not going to say they're the one size fits all, everybody needs them, but they're the most common treatment. 
it's very easy to go down stigma pathways and it's you know in a way it's like is it really that hearing loss like makes us older is this so inaccessible so difficult to get that we've sort of just it's easier to say i don't want it because i don't want to look old um I, you know i find this to be a fascinating thing with stigma but what apple getting involved does is i think it it changes a lot of areas in the marketplace for hearing care one, it's accessible, it's relatively affordable if you're already on an Apple system. So, you know, you've got the AirPods, you know, you've got this ability, you, you may actually have everything you need basically already now that the software updates are rolling out. And now you have an, a solution for easy situations, uh, uh, minimal situations even, like restaurants that are difficult to listen in, but you're not going to necessarily be in for hours, right? And so, this increases people using hearing care. It also sort of gives you an option early on in, in your pathway with hearing loss. You know, we all are losing our hearing loss from the moment we're born, basically, right? It never gets better. Uh, we don't have any really treatment for it. It's just going down. And even if you are perfect and you never, ever, ever listen to loud noises, it's still, unfortunately, <laughs> that system will just deteriorate over time. It's not built to last forever and it's got no regeneration. And so... Hearing sort of sets in slow, insidious, you know, when there's a nice, easy option like that, you can imagine people might start addressing it way earlier. And so they're really getting into that hearing care pathway. So Apple increases accessibility. It increases, you know, for everybody. It gets people in earlier, which also helps with getting used to hearing aids. One of the biggest complaints that we see is if somebody doesn't get hearing aids until it's a massive, massive problem, it takes their brain a while to really acclimate to those hearing aids, right? You can imagine it's like, uh, it's like almost like um, getting a cramp after, you know, not moving for a while and suddenly you move and you get that Charlie horse, right? Uh, you know, it's a muscle response to some extent. And the other thing that I think Apple does is they just change our view of hearing care from sort of like a marketing or business perspective. If I asked you to name one other, you know, traditional hearing aid company. Could you do it? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Yeah. So th there are these companies, Sonova, Phonak, Unitron. Uh, that's actually all one company. Sonova owns both those, but Starkey in the United States. We don't know their name. And so the marketplace is so unfamiliar that it's almost daunting, right? Like most Americans, I think, uh, as a culture, we try to do a little bit of research, right? We go online, we look up what's the best compact SUV or something like that. And if you do that for hearing aids, it's, I mean, it's just sort of a, a wild west, right? It's been a gatekeeper model in healthcare. So Apple sort of builds that brand awareness. It sort of connects the end user to the company in a way that we haven't really had before. And so that, you know, that changes the way people engage. It may also change this stigma issue as people are using them more often, we're seeing people with AirPods in in a restaurant and it moves away from, um, I, I don't even know if this is still a thing, but I can remember when Bluetooth came out and we were all making fun of people walking around talking, right? And they're, they're sitting with a little It looked like they ear. were talking to themselves. I know. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, always. And I think, I guess that's already pretty much over. But now, you know, you can imagine people could think of their AirPods as quite literally just augmenting listening in any situation. And, and really, that, other people will never know if you're using them specifically for that purpose. Who knows? You could just be yeah. talking or listening to a podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not, be, not increasing yeah. your, your hearing. Um, how did they actually differ from, mm -hmm. you know, the over-the-counter options that are available now? How are they different? So... Um, we have sort of, it's, it's an interesting conundrum we have with uh, the way hearing aids are regulated by the FDA. Traditionally, you only have prescription. Now you have a prescription category, like this traditional. You have this over-the-counter category. Uh, and then you have a special label in the over-the-counter category, over -counter category called uh, self-fitting. Essentially, in the two main categories, over-the-counter and prescription, they both have like a set of rules they're supposed to live by. Um, they are technically exempt through the regulatory process. And what that means is, you know, you are submitting to the FDA, you're sort of registering your product saying we abide by the basic standards, right? Um, the self-fitting category is actually different. You have to go through a clinical trial to do that. So Apple fits into just over the counter. 
So they are saying they're going to abide by the basic standards. And the standards are pretty, let's say, wide, right? You, you mm-hmm. can have a wide range of devices, like really, really good, really, really bad, all within that over-the-counter category. And so I think Apple sits on the better end of that category just because, you know, they are a company that understands sound processing. They really are good at, you know, improving your speech and noise. They sort of get the process, right? Um, You know, let's be honest. Instantly, Apple is the most, uh, uh, the largest hearing aid company in the world just by revenue streams because we've never had a hearing aid company that was a Fortune 500 company before. Exactly right. Yeah. So they're really good. The only difference from the prescription category is going to be um, the prescription ones can get louder to address, you know, severe hearing losses, which could be dangerous if you were sort of doing it by yourself. Um, and then, you know, they really are, they're, they're using the AirPods. And that's always going to be something that I think people have, are some people are going to wrestle with, right? A lot of people want the really, really tiny hearing aid that sort of hides behind their ear that that option where it's like completely invisible to some extent won't won't exist but you know maybe as we just talked about with changes in stigma and apple getting involved maybe that sort of goes away um, right we don't need to focus so much on this hide hide everything right and right and we also don't know just... what direction apple will take once they see how this really takes off with the news i'm sure it's going to be quite successful i mean maybe they will come out with those that will be quite relatively invisible. I mean, let's wait and see what happens. But let's first talk about, I mean, you as a healthcare provider, uh, specializing in hearing. I mean, so you have a patient who comes in with my, let's just say me, because I do believe I have some mild hearing loss because when I'm in a restaurant or a certain situation where the, I, I just feel like I could be missing a few things. So I think I am a candidate. So let's say I come in and say, hey, Dr. Reed, I really feel like I have some myeloma. What, what's my first step? I'm assuming it's going to be a hearing test. Now, I have a statistic here. According to Apple, um, 80% of U.S. adults haven't had their hearing checked in the past five years. Um, and guess what? I, I'm one of those people. I have not had my hearing checked in the last five years. So now, of course, because I'm having this conversation with you, I'm making a note that I am going to have my hearing tested probably by you <laughs> in the very near future. So I'm assuming that is the first step. So let's assume you say, yes, Barbara, you do have some mild, maybe even moderate hearing loss. What would your recommend, recommendation be? Like, how do you decide whether this is a good option for your patient or not? Or do you think most people will do this themselves? Would they be self-prescribing Apple um, AirPods? What, what do you think? That's a great question. I mean, there's so many, there's like three questions to unpack there. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think, you know, I'll, I'll sort of diverge slightly. You didn't ask it exactly, but the, the hearing test is the first pathway. And the truth is, we basically, you know, stop engaging in, in assessing or even monitoring our hearing in fifth grade in the United States. Yes. You know, we do school. Uh, you know, we have we have newborn mandated screenings. We have all these things that happen. And then we sort of just stop. Right. And it never, never comes back. You you might, you know, at, at your annual Medicare wellness visit or something, you might get a recommendation to get a hearing test. But so we have a bad relationship with hearing. In in this country and and, well, in the world. And I think part of it is we've turned hearing loss into this strange big black box, right? You either have hearing loss, you don't have hearing loss. Sometimes you you're actually going even further. You're talking about mild, moderate. The truth is we all have a very specific hearing fingerprint. And even two people who are mild in nature could be on very opposite ends of that spectrum. You could have a, a very mild hearing loss and it barely affect you in situations, somebody with an equal mild hearing loss, just based on the pattern of where the loss is at different frequencies even, could be very affected in noise. So I think getting your hearing tested more often is is a big thing. And it's not necessarily because I think your hearing changes rapidly. I think it's more just sort of understanding your own sort of patterns and pathway. This can help explain that to you, but also so can now that we're really in this over-the-counter hearing aid world, I think a lot of software is getting better and better about sort of helping people through this. And so 
let's say you have that mild hearing loss, the, the original intent, that was my soapbox for a second that we all need to understand. Uh, you know, I think engaging in Apple, I personally think the majority of people are going to sort of enter this space on their own first. Um, okay. There will always be people who want to go to an audiologist, but I will, I will fully admit we barely have enough audiologists to engage with the people who have hearing aids now. And less than 20% of those with hearing loss own and use hearing aids. So even if we just have 5% more getting engaged, we, we can't. And so I think a lot of unique technology things are popping up where there's new companies coming out there. You know, I, I hear, I get an email like once a week from somebody who's creating like an AI app or a, uh, a, tele, a telehealth type app. Um, even if it's live connecting to a person to help talk you through things. There's a company in New York City actually called Tuned that uh, I'm not affiliated with, but I do love the the owner. And he has built, uh, him and his team have built a fantastic sort of telehealth, you know, if you need a quick, you know, almost like counseling appointment, right, to, to decide whether you want to use Apple or whether it's going to benefit you. That's that's the kind of thing people can do. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, you know, it's super fascinating to see this kind of change. Uh, I, I haven't been in the field, you know, I've only been I'm only 15 years in or something. And it's like, wow, it's changed. It's completely. really, really, really changing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. let's talk about this. So Apple has, as we've been talking, has been integrating not only this uh, hearing loss um, mm. aspect to their to their product, but also more health features. Um, and in fact, the FDA not that long ago approved the Apple Watch for um, seeing if someone has a fib and yeah. checking on that yeah. on an irregular heart rate. So uh, it's really very interesting. So they're really entering this field in, of healthcare in a very big way. So. And, and so you're seeing, as you just said, a broader shift in, in how tech companies and other companies are really kind of expanding their offerings in this, in, in a way that you can self-check yourself, which is really fascinating. So what, what, do you, what else are you seeing? What else do you see in the future? Oh, I mean, I'm sort of a, you know, I'm not one of those like futurist tech people that believe that we're going to augment everything, but I really think that you know, in a, in a weird way, technology, like healthcare was never going to address chronic conditions of aging very well to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. when, when you think about aging, right, and healthcare, we have an acute care health system, right? We are really good at stamp out a problem immediately when you're in face-to-face -face with, with doctors or nurses or in the hospital, in the doctor's office, in the surgical room. But a lot of healthcare, you know, over, over the the bigger picture is just wellness, right? And then, you know, as we age, we develop chronic conditions. It is literally just a part of aging. Like I said, the ear just deteriorates, our eyes just deteriorate, yes. right? Um, and I find it fascinating that this, this wearable, you know, tech solution and Apple getting involved in health, you know, we often frame it from sort of, you'll see marketing campaigns with 20 year olds, they'll, they'll turn up their AirPods, for example, I'm sure we'll see some, some commercial, they're going to be in a restaurant, and then they're going to turn the AirPods on, and you're going to hear the sound drop on the noise, and they're going to hear their partner at the table. But the reality yeah. is, tech is, it's not, I won't call it a solution, but it is a way to sort of augment and address these chronic conditions that just pop up as we age, right? Mm -hmm. We need something that integrates seamlessly to our lives where it matters for us, that's patient centered. And the truth is healthcare as a system was never going to do that, right? You, you having to come to me to, you know, fix your hearing aids if they break or something like that. Of course, I'm there to help you. Of course, we're there and we're, we're doing our best. But Apple really changes that. And so does just wearables in general with, as you mentioned, uh, monitoring for AFib, monitoring your step counts and changing sort of our lifestyle. I, I really think this is sort of a... It's a it's a weird way that it's happened, but I think it's actually a revolution in aging to a certain extent that, you know, technology sort of fills the gaps that we haven't been able to. 
Yes, absolutely. And I agree with you. I think all of these wearables are helping us to age better by just yeah. allowing us to keep tabs on our own health and well-being, as you just pointed out, counting the steps and, and every other way that you just described. And in fact, recently I had a, a medical expert on talking about AFib and specifically talking about the Apple Watch, I mean, as part of the conversation. And she was totally pro Apple Watch and having people who might be at risk for AFib or who have AFib fib to um to really monitor that so no it's really really great and i'm very encouraged by that i think that the more control that people feel they have over their own health and well-being um you know the more engaged they'll be maybe the the yeah. more that they'll change lifestyle to age better which is always yeah. the point of the conversations i have so okay i think we covered everything <laughs> i wanted to cover today dr reed i really great. do i mean I just, I feel that, and I want to hear your takeaways, of course, before I let you go, but I just feel that really everyone should get a hearing test. And I think that the vast majority of the Age Better listeners listening in right now, probably like me, haven't had a hearing test unless there was some major issue going on, obviously, in the last five years either. So I really encourage everyone listening in to please start by getting a hearing test and then take it from there and see how things go. But Dr. Reed, so I know you're a busy, 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 busy doctor and you have patients to see. So thank you for today. But before I let you go, what are your top three biggest takeaways from our conversation today? We should get our hearing checked and we need to change our relationship with hearing from sort of a big black scary box that we don't know anything about to this is quite literally your hearing number. This is your fin your hearing fingerprint, if you will. Um, and as a small aside, you can get that accurately on Apple with the AirPods. So you don't always have to go to a professional and we're seeing more companies sort of do that. So uh, it, it's, it's accessible now, right? We've changed the system. Uh, I think the other takeaway is hearing care has drastically changed in the past two years. We've gone from prescription models to over-the-counter models that meet your lifestyle needs where you are. And, you know, we no longer are at a stage where we should ignore our hearing loss for so long. If you have a problem, even in slight situations like a little bit of noise in a restaurant, you should do something early, try to adapt, try to get your brain sort of engaging in that hearing care and, and getting used to listening with amplification. Um, and I think from a, a third one, just a big picture, you know, my takeaway is actually this is this is one of those stepping stone conversations that, you know, hearing care is catching up to other areas of tech and health integration. But we are really starting to see this seamless, you know, integration of technology into our lives from everything from augmenting to addressing chronic conditions, which is sort of an optimal aging revolution, which um is the name of the the center and institute that I'm at that NYU Langone just started, the Optimal Aging Institute. Where Could you tell us a little bit about that, actually? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Optimal Aging Institute is a new initiative, uh, well, a new institute at uh, NYU Langone. We are a multidisciplinary institute. You know, for example, I'm an audiologist, epidemiologist. Our director uh, is an MD, PhD. He's a very, very well-known public health scientist, epidemiologist, and trialist who focused early on in his career on really understanding kidney care and risk for kidney disease. And he's cha he's really transformed into this dementia researcher over the course of his career, which uh, by many metrics, he's one of the top scientists in the world too. It's There's these weird ways that they rank us and he he fills the, the top a lot. Um, and then we have people who are demographers thinking about population level statistics. We are engaged with precision medicine. Uh, we are engaged with geriatrics and gerontology, of course, family medicine, otolaryngology. I think that I've never seen anything like sort of what NYU is doing, basically bringing people across all health disciplines and no longer saying, you know, oh, you know, mo most of the time an aging institute is, is several geriatricians and gerontologists. But instead right. saying, let's bring all of your expertise to the table and let's just remember that geriatrics and aging, it's still a whole body and a whole person. And we should be studying this from all angles. Holistically. In, holistically and not in ways that are, let's think of it as a medical condition to stamp out. Let's just think of it as optimizing, you know, aging and optimizing life. And which is probably something the whole healthcare system should do. But 
At least we're focusing on one end of the spectrum at the moment. Oh, that's very exciting. That's very forward thinking. And and as my listeners know, I very often have medical experts from NYU Langone Health yes. on the show from various departments. And so this is a very exciting evolution in your hospital and a system. And uh, I'm excited about it. And in fact, um, I'm sure I'll be plugging into some of your colleagues from yeah. the Institute very, very soon. <laughs> That sounds great. Yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to point out to everyone, I will have uh, links uh, in the show notes about all of the things we talked about, including the article uh, in the Wall Street Journal where Dr. Reed, where I first uh, read your comments, and and also about uh, I'd like to give the listeners some information about that tech company that you were referring to that mm. you really like, Tuning, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, tuned. Tuned. Yeah. I'll have a link yeah. to Tuned as well so people can get more information. And you did mention something I want to stress is that you are correct that you can, in fact, get a hear uh, do a hearing test at home yeah. with your, um, um, I think, your iPad and computer. You can, or You can do it with um, any iPhone. Oh, well, I guess not any iPhone. It's got to be more recent, but iPhone and iPads. One. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, incredible. So everyone, I'll have a link to that information as well so you can check it out. Dr. Reed, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Very, very helpful. Good information to help us all age better. Thanks so much for having me.